Hello. I'm um, talking about a uh, um, project that I've been working on for the last year um, called LibExplain. And it's, it's intended as um, a library of system core specific extra error replacements. But it, it starts much longer ago. Um, back when my pet dinosaur was still alive, uh, in 83, I was working on a PDP-11 at the time and I wasn't really impressed with error messages. This was pre-str error, it was pre-ANSI standard, so you had to use whatever that sys error array was and hope you didn't walk off the end of the array and all sorts of things. Um, but there still weren't great error messages and it seemed to me that somewhere in the kernel, the kernel knew what the problem was because it took the other branch and said no. And I thought, wouldn't it be really great if you could recapitulate that in user, user space and give a better error message? But there were problems with that. Um, we're, we're talking version 7 Unix. There was no slash proc. Um, there wouldn't be slash proc on any Unix for some time to come. There was no LSOF. That was 10 years away as well. So it, it, it looked like a really good idea, but completely impractical on a 64K machine. Um, and no shared libraries, so you had enormous problems. And uh, I was looking at, at the fact that there's, there's the most dreadful lack of information coming through. I had made the mistake of, of asking um, glibc, how many symbols it exported for applications to link to, and it's over 800. Um, glibc is pretty generous with symbols. Um, but it, it wasn't that easy. It was impractical to reproduce it. The programs were big enough already, and it wouldn't fit having a library full of explanations you might never need. So I kind of thought, well, it's a good idea, but it's really impractical. And I left it behind, but it's been chewing at me ever since because I've, I've had this bunch of error handling code that seems to land in every project I ever work on that does general error handling and sometimes very specific error handling um, such as some mag tape handling utilities I wrote one time. Uh, and you get interesting things happening with interesting devices. Um, so today I'm talking about... Um, what happened to make me actually go and write it, you know, 25 years later. Um, and it's, it's an interesting place to be looking. It's kind of like, it's kind of like putting your car up on the hoist and looking up at the underside. And it's really functional, frequently really ugly, and there's a lot of mud and crud as well. Um, and so that's where we're looking. We're looking at the error handling. We're looking at the ugly parts today. Um, and see if we can make them a little less ugly, at least a little less ugly for our users. So I want to talk a little bit first about some of those uglies. Um, error messages are, are actually one of those 1% things that we drop on the floor when there's schedule pressure. You know, this error is unlikely to happen, and if it does, it's pretty obvious why it's an error. You know, we won't dedicate any effort to it, and um, we might make it look pretty. But it's one of those 1% things that pays off hugely in the user experience. It's the difference between ringing up tech support to figure out what it's trying to tell you. This one's a doozy. I love this one. Um, ring up tech support because they can't figure out what happened. And tech support then go and you know, ring up the developer and go, well, what happened? I... I'm identifying here a, a spectrum of usefulness in error messages um, from completely useless, slightly informative, and I'm trying to put a peg in the ground much further along in the goodness scale. And I debated about this zero goodness slide. It's a logical progression. And then I realized when I was doing computer science at Sydney in, oh gee, 79, there was a lecturer there who had a philosophy that you didn't bother testing for errors you couldn't do anything about. 
So if you did f open on a file and then proceeded to use the file handle, you got a seg fault. And his rationale was all of his users could use a debugger. <clears throat> okay, I'm pretty sure not all of our users can do that. So what we've got is, is one of the more common um, completely useless error messages. This is only slightly further along the goodness scale. You know something went wrong. <clears throat> but it's not very helpful. It doesn't tell you what went wrong. You haven't given a file name on the command line, so that's probably not your fault. It might be, but maybe not. But you can't tell. The user's got no information to go from. Now, we, of course, will wake up a debugger or we'll wake up um, strace or we'll wake up truss or all those other wonderful tools that we use. And we can actually watch the system calls go past. And we know a way to find out which file it was. But our users don't necessarily have that ability. If it's a GUI program, they're even worse out of luck because much too much is happening and they're very, very hard to figure it out. Um, <clears throat> But not only that, the tools aren't necessarily even installed on their machine. I mean, they don't know how to use them, and they're not installed, so, you know, they're behind eight ball twice. Uh, but it gets worse. You see, what happens is this text winds up in a bug report. So now you've got a poor maintainer who's got a bug report, and he can't do anything about it. It was six months ago on the other side of the planet, you know, a long, long time ago, on a server far, far away, can't open file. It's not helpful. Not helpful at all. Um, so, uh, should I see um, some of my um, team members uh, doing this, I tend to take to them with a clue stick. Um, and this is typically what their source file looks like. They haven't paid much attention to it. It doesn't matter. It's never going to go wrong. Move on. Uh, and so they, they don't put any thought into it. But it's, it's precisely can't ever go wrong where it's essential to provide vastly more information so that at least you're going to get useful feedback when you finally start reading the bug reports on the bug tracker. Um, so you take to them with a clue stick and you say, there's this thing called P error. And they go, oh, OK, I'll use that instead. Except that it didn't help. They have, uh, quite by accident, actually told us which system call. Because, of course, if it's open for read only or create, there are different permissions required, for example. So, you know, but it was probably an accident that he gave us the, the system call. And it's, it's actually quite relevant. If you're trying to figure out the problem, you are on the receiving end of this. Somebody's rung you up and said, um, it says there's no file called open. Now, now, now what did it actually say? <coughs> it, it's, it, it's tricky. And you, you don't need this. So you take another trip down the hall with a bigger clue stick. And he changes it. Finally, we actually have relevant information. One step forward, one step back. He's left out the system call. You know, now, if it was permission denied instead of no such file or directory, well, was it denied for reading or denied for writing? You can't figure it out because he left at least the clue of the system call out. So then you say, well, actually, there's a more advanced thing that got introduced in... Uh, in um, when was the first C standard? C89? C89 called str error. And so now we have our three things. We have the system call, we have the file name, and we have an, a plain language description of the error. Terrific. And that's as good as it gets. That's what the reference is. Um, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, no, in 83, I thought that there was another point out there further along the scale. Um, and I, <clears throat> I was working at the time, this was end of 2008. I was working at the time, and these weren't dumb people asking these questions. 
Maybe they were dumb error messages. So the, the caption at the top is really important. Okay? There's, there's a difference between competent and then you can put that nice spin on it and add some finesse. You know? And so I don't think these yet have any finesse. I think they need to because it's, it's, it's one of those things. I'm trying to imagine my wife getting on the phone to explain to the mechanic um, that thing that's brown under there, well, it's got a thing that's black on the side and it's squealing. When your users bump into this error message, right, this, is the, this is the functional, really ugly, muddy, cruddy bit on the underside of the car. And if you're on the receiving end of a telephone getting a description, you want it to be better. If you're the receiver of a bug report and you're reading it, you want more information. M my son routinely paddles down the hall and says, Dad, the internet's <coughs> uh, broken again. And, oh yes, um, what particular aspect of the internet it isn't? Oh, okay. Can you tell me that text of the error message, please? Oh, I didn't remember that. Um, you need more information. So, okay, can we place a stake further along in the, in, the, in the spectrum? But I want to talk a little bit first about why this stuff out of str error is so not helpful. The problem is, if you look at the man page for str error, it says very, very clearly, str error returns a string describing the error number. Str error is not describing your error. Str error is describing that 8-bit number that came back from some enormous cross-product of horrible things and you're getting no bandwidth. So A, it's not describing your error and B, it's just describing a number. It's not terribly helpful. So <clears throat> that's the first problem. Uh, go back. Didn't want you to do that straight away. Anyway, um, so as I alluded to before, at some point in the kernel, it's been going down code branches, yes, 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 nope. And then it returns you this very small integer. So from, this is, when, I, when I say the kernel knows what happened, this is what I'm referring to. There was a code branch somewhere that said, mm-mm. So, and I'm using knows in a very loose sense. But it seems to me that if user space did the same thing, it could know too. It could do the same decisions with the same or at least sufficiently similar branches and go, oh, I found it. it this is why. Yes, we'll get to it. Uh, kernels have a bunch of constraints that make it not a great place to put it. Again, it's, it's tramp code. If we can leave it outside of the kernel, there's less to maintain. You can get out of sync, which is an issue, I agree. Um, but there are some good reasons putting in user space, particularly size. Um, and I'll show you some examples of size. Um, and internationalization, which really stinks. I'll get to that. But there's the file name problem. See, if you're printing an error message for open, you know, two lines of code down, you've got, where's our example? Right, we say open, and it opens. Two lines of code later, we want to print the file name. And the file name's conveniently right there. It's really easy to put the file name in the error message. But if you proceed to go to other parts of your program, calling deeply, passing file descriptors around, if you are conscientious and want to actually give a slightly better experience, should read, say, no, or write, say, out of room, or whatever, you actually have to pass all the way down this call stack next to the file descriptor the file name all for a message that in all probability will be issued very, very rarely. 
And again, for certain values of no's, the kernel knows the name of the file. So why do I have to pass redundant data along with my file descriptor when the kernel knows which file went broken? And this was one of the things that was impractical in System 7 Unix in 1983. Um, the Linux kernel provides you with vastly more metadata in slash proc than all the others. Uh, and so we can exploit the fact that, that the Linux kernel keeps track of this. And it keeps track of it so you don't need your redundant argument passing. You don't need a struct full of interesting things. You might want it for other reasons, but you don't have to. Uh, so let's, let's whiz back again. Uh, So this is what I'm calling the file name problem. So just to give you a handle of the fact that sometimes you have to pass redundant data down. And it's not uncommon to have an error message that says read colon. No. And a str error string is like, that is so very handy because I can't do anything with it. It's like our error message before that said, open no such file or directory. But what's the program going to do? I mean, he doesn't know the the name of the file. But it turns out slash proc is vastly better than life was back in 83. And it can do things for us that libexplain exploits. The path name problem is merely a, an easy way to explain. There are other parameters which are passed equally confusingly at times. And to get a good error message, we actually need to look at the arguments to our system call. It's not enough to have just the file name sometimes. Sometimes you need more. So, didn't leave a pointer there for a while. Back in 2008, um, being told by the boss that I would never, ever, ever have to talk to users ever, um, so I'm, you know, level infinity technical support, I had a constant stream of people leaning over my desk going, can you tell me what this means? Because apparently I was the local Unix guru and always knew everything. And I thought, you know, this interrupting thing is really old. And these are smart sysadmins. They're very smart testers. These are capable people and they need it translated. Something's broken. Something's very broken. But no. But now there's slash proc. Slash proc's wonderful. Have you ever done an ls on slash proc slash self slash fd? It is lovely. It is really great. It gives you the technical buzzword is reflection, introspection. You can see yourself, and it's very handy. Um, the FD directory is full of sim links to the name of the file that got opened. Yay! I mean, they're absolute paths as well, which is a bonus. We don't have to remember where they were opened, where they were. So, this is a good thing. Um, and on those systems that have a really horrid slash proc, um, there's LSOF, which plays much more intimate games with the kernel's private paths to extract information. So I decided I was fed up being a psychic medium to pieces of silicon. <clears throat> I didn't want to do that anymore. I actually like writing software, not error wrangling. And so I sat down and I started typing. And I did a proof of concept. because I still wasn't sure it would work. So here we have, this isn't the first example I did, but it's close. Here we have a typical piece of code that would use str error, sort of wrap to fit in the available state. And that looks pretty normal. Now what I wanted to do in making all of this happen is I wanted it to be as natural as possible. I didn't want to introduce too much. I wanted it to be straightforward and simple. And my original concept, I figured I probably couldn't call it 
strip error, you know, open and strip error closed. Probably a bad idea. So I thought, well, what's it actually doing? Instead of telling me about the error, it's actually explaining what happened. So this is the equivalent code using strip error, uh, using loop explain. And one of the features of this is that you pass all of the arguments to your system call. And libexplain is very, very consistent. Every single one, because sufficient of them need all the arguments, to be consistent, so it's easy to remember how to use libexplain, you just give it all the arguments, same order, same type, same values. Have I made a mistake, Eric? Slow down. Smell the roses. You, you should ask that question of strip error, by the way. So here's the equivalent code. Okay? And this, all these examples have actually been tried. <coughs> There's an extensive regression test suite. It's not so very different. But what it does is, where this code prints, you know, I tried to move this file from here to here and the following thing happened. That printing the representation of the system call gets delegated as well. Because in some cases it's very important that the representation of the system call contains information not always needed, but when you need it, you better have it. For example, if you, there are some interesting options for open. And not all of them apply to all devices and all files. And sometimes it needs, it needs the flag argument so it can say, you use that option and the file's one of those. Of course it didn't work. And explain that it's not going to work. So you need all the options. And when it prints the representation, it prints open, path name equals nicely quoted strings so that all of the um, control characters that they passed in because they actually gave you uninitialized memory are all nicely escaped and your terminal doesn't go into alternate character set, for example. So they're all nicely escaped. And the f in the case of open, the flags are in these. In fact, not printed numerically, it's printed symbolically, like strace would print it. So it gives you a lot of information. When you're first developing code, this is what you need. Oh, yeah, of course, that was dumb. And sometimes, oh, well, yeah, it's obviously uninitialized memory. Um, but it, there's actually a, a cycle involved, and there are other reasons for doing it. Sometimes you've got to do a bit of error recovery before you print the message. So you stash the value of Erno, do some stuff, and then you print the error message. And LibXBain has facilities for this. All the, when you see rename here, just sort of, it's meta. They all work this way. They all have consistently named function calls. This is Eric's question. Normally, libexplain works with a very large statically allocated buffer. And they all share it. This isn't thread safe. But then, neither is strip error. And so, there's a, there's a, there's a convention in libc that you get underscore r on the end of things for, for threaded work. And there's a threaded version of strip error, which returns inconsistent things. So I didn't use the return value. In libexplain, the equivalent function returns void just to set expectations the right way. And so we had two cases, one where we had to stash there and do some error covering, one where we didn't. So now we have a nice two by two orthogonal bunch of functions. OK, that's great. Every single one of these examples, I went two again. Every single one of these examples had an exit in it. So when I first started suggesting people might like to try it for me to see whether it actually worked outside of my proof of concept, they came up with some suggestions pretty rapidly. So I borrowed a little from Perl. And now we have or die. And I thought, gee, that's very nice. And it is, you know, some candy to tempt people to at least try it. 
but I'm not going to use it. And lo and behold, when I actually went and took my existing projects and started applying libexplain to them, I used or die 99% of the time for command line programs. Um, I didn't expect to use it. Um, I didn't even think of it to start with. Somebody else did. But it's there all the time. And, gee, the code looks clean. All of that cruft that gets in the way, all of the, all of the code that is normally left out of textbooks, you know, error handling is as an exercise for the student. Um, all the error handling is there. It's just nice and neat. So, these are the, this is the, this is the majority of, of the things you actually need to know about the API in order to use it. Okay? They are rigidly consistent in their arguments. Oh, thank you. Where? Oh, okay, thank you. It's not meant to be order. It's meant to be or die. Uh, so they're, they're very consistent, and they always work that way. Where it says args dot dot dot, it wants all of them. Um, I haven't given you many examples yet. We will actually get there. So here is a very dumb cat. It reads files on studin, assumes they're text, writes them to stud out, complete error reporting all the way. So our process, there's no tramp data. There's no redundant arguments that I might use and I might not use. All I do is call fread or die and call fwrite or die. And I defy anybody to actually remember how fwrite remembers errors. It's, some of the studio stuff is inconsistently inconsistent. But this guy will print, if there's, you know, a no space on output, it'll tell you a no space on output. But here's the fun part, right? It's stood out. So you go, cat, this file, this file, larger than Fred. The error message will tell you the name of the file it ran out of space writing. Now, the program never saw Fred the shell knew about Fred, but this program didn't. And yet, the error message contains Fred by using that wonderful stuff in slash proc. Or LSOF. That's hidden. You don't need to know anything about it. It just works. If you use the or die variant, yes. If you don't use the or die variant, it does not. So, yeah, if you use the or die variant, it calls fread for you, examines the result, um, including the really obscure results. Have you ever tried to figure out whether read der found an error? It's not pretty. Um, <clears throat> so, so, this guy actually can print more information than our previous effort would have with, with tramp data call, accompanying the file descriptor all the way down our stack. And the same deal for the input file, including, let's, let's scroll this one, we can redirect std out, that's got a minus O option, we might process std in. So of course if there's an IO error, it never had the name of what stood in was, but if you said, you know, cat larger than... How many of your users who are smart people say cat larger than file to read it? It's spooky, but they do. This program will tell you the name of the file on stood in. If it's a pipe, it'll tell you it's a pipe. If it was a socket, it will tell you the address of the other end. Um, and do a name lookup, if you turn that flag on. And so, so this is... This is a program, and it's not one of those, here's an example from the textbook, and all of the error handling is an exercise for the student. 
In fact, this one's got... Did that stop one? This one has all of the error handling. Um, it's not left as next to this for the student. But I find this, this much more readable. The actual intent isn't obfuscated with the multiple sets of six lines of error handling scattered everywhere. Which I hadn't thought of as being the result when I started this project. I was after good error messages. I didn't expect it to tell me things that I couldn't have known in the first place. So Rusty's scale of interface goodness is, is something that everybody here should read. Um, and it's something that I kept very, very much in the forefront of my mind in trying to get it to work. Um, as I said before, the, 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 the conventions used in the API are ruthlessly consistent. Um, now, I put number 10 there um, as an aspirational goal. Um, there are some places where you can't get it wrong. One of, the, one of the commonest things that I do wrong is I'll go int fd equals explain open args because I've forgotten that I should have said explain open or die. And the compiler says, no, you can't assign a char star to an int. You're a silly person. Um, so when we're, we're down on the next line. Level 9, goodness. The compiler won't let you get it wrong. But what if it's supposed to return an int? That's messy. Um, well, what if it's supposed to return a char star? But there aren't terribly many functions that actually return a char star. Um, and many of the, those that do return a char star, it's kind of redundant. They've actually got a null or a nu not null pointer. But it gets more fun, of course, because you go, huh, okay, so I've got the read wrong. I know that libexplain will call the read for me, and if there's an error, it's going to exit for me. So I'll just call explain read file descriptor data length. That returns a char star. That's not nice. Turns out that there's this really hoopy thing in GCC. You can have, you can tag functions with an attribute that says warn unused result. So I tagged them all with warn unused result. And suddenly, whenever I'd said explain read, where I should have said explain read or die, I got a warning. But if you put in minus error to turn all the warnings into errors, you crank it back up to level nine goodness. Uh, so this is what we want to do. Um, obvious is tricky. I tried for obvious, and it wasn't. The, I tried to stick with the original order of the arguments, the original arguments, in fact. Um, the less there is to remember, the easier it is to use. So I, I tried for that. I'm not sure I got, I'm not sure I got uh, obvious, but I, I tried for obvious. Um, and the names try to tell you how to use it. If you've got one of those function calls that we were looking at earlier, hmm, sorry, I should organize it though. So we've got these function calls. Everything has an explain underscore um, pseudo namespace on the front. So that's always first. Um, if it gets written into a message buffer, message comes next in the name, and it's the next two arguments. If you would pass it erno, erno comes next in the name, and the next argument is your erno value. And following that are all the other values. If it's an or die or a on error, it just takes the original arguments and explains it for you and calls it for you. So I tried for consistent so that it was predictable um, and, and there. And, and I'm looking at do it right at runtime or it will die. Um, LibExplain is actually meant to be the upside down part of that. If you do it wrong at runtime, LibExplain will tell you and explain it. Um, also, there's, there's code in there to handle, gee whiz, that was a silly thing to pass, wasn't it? Um, 
System calls are really clever. They can say, oh, that would have seg faulted if I dereferenced it, so I returned default instead. User land's slightly different. We don't quite have that level of detail. But lib explain copes, actually. Follow common convention and get it right. Um, the common convention I chose was to be inconsistently inconsistent consistently with libc. So that I'm consistent with libc. I'm not speaking for libc, although I hate it. But anyway, OK? And last but not least, read the documentation and you will get it right. Every sync, and you're free to raise a bug report if you find an exception, because it's a bug. Every single function in the public API has Doxygen documentation that is not stripped when the .h files are installed. So the documentation is there. And I have endeavoured to put all the exceptions, all of the but, you know, if you're, if you're using the variants that don't take a message buffer, it says, oh, by the way, this function is not thread safe, for example. So I tried to provide complete documentation because <laughs> libexplain is meant to explain stuff. So obviously the API better do some explaining too, otherwise it's not going to be very helpful. So you've seen a couple of messages. When I first wrote this section, it was chock full of examples because that's what I thought this section was about. It isn't quite. Here's an example for open, a fairly common problem. Um, I have people bump into it often. My wife and son bump into it often. And it's explanation. Now, the explanation breaks into three pieces. And I think the pieces are important. Um, obviously, if you're the developer and you're making something work for the first time, you really want to know how you stuffed up. And so you want the stuff that was in our original example way back when that said, you know, open file name and why it failed. And so the first two parts of our error message, system call failed, here's the system error, with a little bit of sugar it tells you the numbers and the Erno text. Uh, those suckers are not consistent across Unixes, by the way, nor is the text, so it really makes unit testing hard. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I've had false negatives because the str error string was inconsistent. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. Uh, so you deal with it and move on. And then at the end, you've got explanation. The explanation part, after because, is meant to be plain language. Now, it is perfectly valid to suggest that that bit at the front looks really technical and scary and that it could frighten users, particularly if you're actually giving full detail on an F-lock call. Uh, but I use that example specifically. In, in a couple of my projects, I use locking. When locking goes south, it goes south inexplicably. The more information you can give, the better. Um, and I've had emails going, this stupid locking thing happened, and the error message was wonderful because I'd given a representation of the F-lock call that included the contents of the struct that you pass as an argument, as a pointer. So it was informative. But the second thing is, of course, you as a developer, you need that information when you're first developing it. But let's go big circle. On a server, a long, long time ago, a long way away, somebody had an error. And they said, I don't know what that is. Can somebody explain it? Can't explain it. Raise a bug, put it in the bug system, sits there for six months festering. So six months later, the server's in a completely different state. Oh, and it's in a geographically different state as well. Um, you can't get access to the machine. The process is gone and has been gone for a while. The machine's been rebooted. If the text wasn't presented to the user so they can go copy, paste, it won't get in that bug report, and the maintainer who needs it can't read it. Because it's like my son paddling down the hall going, Dad, internet's broken. It doesn't help. Because you've got a developer at the beginning, fixing a bug, you've got a developer again. Somehow it has to pass through that whole system and provide you with 
the actual thing that went wrong. Now, I admit, this is the proximal cause of the error. It's not the actual cause, you know. Dude, you're in the wrong directory. LibExplain can't tell you that, sorry. But it can give you accurate information what right here, right now, happened. And so it gave up. Now, what's my next piece? Yeah, okay. So we've, we've covered an awful lot of this stuff already. Yon? Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm actually aware that I've got... Ah, stop p-bouncing. I have more material than I have time, so I'm trying to... Yes, uh, question? <laughs> so here we go. This is the before part. And it tries deliberately to reproduce the system call at about the same level as S-Trace. And it tries to do it in good programmer speak. I mentioned earlier, Erno values are not consistent across systems. So saying error 5 is particularly useless. 5 is probably consistent at 113, 145. Then they get start interesting out there. So you don't want, you don't want a 5. You want the stuff the programmer, well, after I hit them with a clue stick a few times, the stuff that the programmer would have written using, you know, seek set and seek curve for the L seeks, not zero and one and all of those other things. Um, or alternatively show them how they should have written it if they used a zero. So this is a system call and it's deliberately that piece of information. Now, if you're a, an extremely advanced sysadmin, you know, perhaps you're the local Unix guru and you've been playing with this stuff for 30 years. Yeah, maybe you could stop reading. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to stop reading too. I'm writing this so that the users stop coming to my desk. It wasn't going to be useful for me. I was wrong. Now this part, after because, this is meant to be a plain language explanation of what happened. Um, the, the code has been internationalized, mostly. And I'm busy refactoring the bits that haven't. Um, the proof of concept was entirely in English. And yes? It, it says, um, because there is no sum directory in the, double quotes, full path of the directory that there's no sum directory in. Depends. No, it doesn't. Good point. If libexplain thinks you're a background process or a daemon process or a server process or your parent process's current directory and your current directory are different, it says, you know, I reckon relative paths are going to be useless and it, it never says current directory. It always gives absolute paths because um, this was a use case that I bumped into in converting my own projects and relative paths on things in the background. It's like, where was I when I launched it? So yes, if it thinks there's a chance that it, it's ambiguous, it'll use absolute paths. And it's got some, this is probably reasonably good heuristic test for this is probably ambiguous. Um, and it's all isolated in one function, so it can be called a number of places. Um, for different uses. So, as I mentioned, the, it's, it's nearly mostly completely internationalized. There, is, there are no translations yet, but I've had the good fortune to go drinking with Conrad, and he suggested that I better make sure that those three pieces, you know, system call, failed, system error, because thing, I better make sure you can rearrange them, because different languages have different grammars. So the provision is in and coded to make that happen. Yes? In, there are cases where I tried that, 
and I wasn't happy with the results because there's a really neat thing. In printing the representation of the system call, you print the names of the arguments. So where you need to talk about a particular argument, instead of saying the first argument, the second argument, you can give, give a name. And that kind of didn't work when the name was a forward reference. You know, because you think, old path? What's an old path? Oh, it's a rename, of course. But it's not, of course, for a normal user. So it actually gives context for the because part, if it needs context. And I found that ordering worked quite well. Um, it also left impatient sysadmins with a point they could stop reading. Um, I actually now myself suggest you keep reading, because it's almost always useful. Um, of course, language translations are always welcome. So sometimes when you haven't got strace, or you can't run it but you know what the Erno was, you can do a little bit of post-mortem. Now, this is a different process. Its context and its state are different. So it might not be able to figure out what happened. But it's pretty close a lot of the time. And it simply calls into the appropriate explanation function. Um, this is one of the ways that I use to test libexplain. But it also turns out to be pretty handy. So here we go. We've got our rename call. And we've got, there you go, there's context in the message. There's a, there's a new path in there. So this is, this is one of the tools. And sometimes it's handy. It's not handy. No need to. Uh, again, the, the Erno values are, you can give a number. You can give the hash define. You can even put it in quotes and give the text of the error message. And it uses the local versions of all of those things. So if you put in a BSD1 on a BSD system, it'll get it right. And if you put a BSD1 on a Linux system, it will think you're slightly cuckoo. Sometimes, where they're you know, really consistently inconsistent. So, oh, mm. wow, OK. So, how much time we got? None. Oh, dear. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. where to get it? <laughs> Google knows. URLs on the side of the screen. So we had lots of questions. We have time we, for... We, we don't actually have time for one. any questions. We have the next session okay. due to start here three minutes ago. Minus um, one question. LCA 2010 would like to thank Peter for the uh, presentation and uh, would like to offer him this gift of a lovely bottle of uh, wine. Oh, thank you. Thank you.